Hello, folks. Welcome to another episode of Marketing Cheat Codes. My name is Ed Brielt. I am the host of Marketing Cheat Codes, and I'm ridiculously excited to have someone on, Tamsin Webster, who I just think is phenomenal. And in the world of cheat codes, she is the mind behind one that I think is universally applicable to almost any aspect of life, the red thread. Uh, really want to get into that. Tamsin, how are you today? I am very well. Sun's shining. It's a beautiful day. It's good. It's good. Excellent. So when you're not industry thought leading, keynote speaking, telling stories, writing books, um, being the founder of your organization, what are, your, what are you doing then? Oh, okay. So who am I outside of work? Uh, who are you outside well, of work? Yeah, I am a, I'm a, I'm a mom, mom, I'm a dog, mom. Uh, I am a crossword puzzler. I'm a mystery <laughs> novel reader, um, inveterate traveler. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank goodness we can do that again. So yeah, it's a, it's a rich, full life I lead. Yeah. I remember, um, watching you one time, I think, do you have, um, your, your fur baby, um, yes is uh what kind of breed is it again he's a uh, retired a racing greyhound greyhound yeah oh, that's right yes yeah walnut the i don't dog. see him back there yeah no today you know he's in the other room yeah sometimes he's back there <laughs> and he, he inserts a paw into the image and it's adorable yeah it's totally yeah remember seeing his paws yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i he is he i I used to have my camera kind of my and my setup oriented the different way, except that meant yeah. that my door was shut. And then when we got Walnut, he was not tolerant of shut doors. So, um, <laughs> yes, we have this view so that occasionally he uh, makes an appearance. That's awesome. All right. So we we might see Walnut today. You might see Walnut. We'll see. <laughs> awesome. Now, so I know you really well. I've studied your works. I've applied your concepts literally to almost everything. I'm always asking that question, like, what's the red thread? You know, big applications in terms of like, what's my brand story? Um, all the way down to like, hey, I've got a board meeting in three weeks. Mm -hmm. How do I concept the narrative of strategies I've put in place to results of the business, to what it means and having this con this this thread of... Um, this through line through what I'm about to tell the, this micro narrative, so to speak of my quarterly results, I find it generally applicable to almost everything. And you pull from the a, a great deal of history, religion traces back. And it's a big concept. I want to unpack it for the audience sure. and that's my teaser, but I want to hear about how you even got to this concept first. Tell me a little bit about your career arc. Cause you've got quite sure. a resume. Sure. Yeah, so I um, I've spent 25 years in brand and message strategy, and then for 13 of those years, I moonlighted as a Weight Watchers leader. <laughs> that yeah, that's a whole story. Uh, and then for the last eight plus years, I've been uh, also moonlighting. Well, no longer a Weight Watchers leader, but uh, now I moonlight as the idea strategist and formerly the executive producer of TEDx Cambridge. Um, and so I've spent most of my career as a message strategist or presentation strategist in some form. Uh, it's definitely mm -hmm. what I found that I loved the most about all that work. Uh, and it comes from the fact that I'm just completely obsessed with how to, like, what are the beliefs that drive behavior? How is it that we can make and maintain transformational change? And whether that's with health goals or whether that's with ideas worth spreading or whether that's for some, you know, CPG company, you know, that I may, right. may have been working with. Um, I've just been always really, really interested in that. And so, yeah, I, I, Kind of dove deep on all the all the different aspects of that, both you know all the different applications of that, um, and it it has turned into a, a you know a fa fairly successful career. I'm happy to say, you know, a book, and you know, I've got seven of my speakers have been featured on TED.com, and you know, they're over you know, twelve million plus YouTube view views at this point. Um, yeah. But I'm probably most proud of you know things like. The, the money that the startup companies and the nonprofits that I've worked with have raised as a result of all this. So um, I love my work. I love big ideas. So it's been, it's been, it's been a fun ride. Yeah. And that ride has given us a gift. I'm, I want to get into it. 
this concept, let's get right into this concept sure. of the red thread that I think is extremely powerful if folks understand it. Um, I mentioned my ability to apply it to big, big idea concepts, small idea, like micro um, narratives of tying things together. Um, and I think you do an amazing job of like the 101 explanation of it for folks who like, it's a, it's such a, an amazing concept, but if you could give us the 101 on it sure. and maybe yep. even some history, I think that really starts to get the light bulbs turning on for folks and that we can get into the, the, how it's applied into whatever form of business. Yeah. So there's a number of quick and easy ways to describe what it is, but to me, the, the, the primary thing is that, that, a red thread is a story that drives action. And more specifically, it's a story that we tell ourselves that drives action. Um, and what one of the reasons why I have found that it is so powerful is because we do this anyway, right? We as humans are wired for story, as the phrase goes. Uh, we create these stories as explanations of why the world is the way that it is or why we do or don't do the things that we do. And so the whole idea behind the red thread was, well, people are going to be doing this anyway. Why not identify that in advance, articulate it, make sure that that story that they would tell themselves is really clear. So the, the history of it is that I kind of had a concept of this, right? This, you know, Chris Anderson of TED called it a through line. Um, most of us want to know, like, what's the big idea behind something? Yeah. Um, and then separately, I had this phrase, the red thread, which was completely not mine, but was something that I had heard uh, some clients from that I had that who were Swedish used. And I initially thought that I'm like, this must be a Swedish phrase, uh, this red thread, because in the context of saying, what's the big idea of something or, you know, what's, the, what's your argument for this? They would say, what's the red thread? And not only did like my inner alliteration lover just delight in that, right? But it was, it's also such a, a tangible, you know, visceral image for the thing that connects things, the thing that you know, kind of explains why things are the way they are. And so I'd come up with this process um, separately, this method of kind of really figuring out what is this story that we tell ourselves. And it was when I discovered why the red thread is called the red thread that I was like, oh, this is a this is a name for the same thing. It, it you know yeah. I if I call this like both it is a description of both the method and the output of what you're looking for. And so since you asked me about that, so the they believe that the red thread in that context. So there's there's red threads in just about every culture throughout the world, and they have slightly different connotations. But in the context of this through line, this thing that makes things make sense. Um, they we believe that that comes from the Greek legend of Theseus and the Minotaur and the Minotaur's labyrinth and the th the red thread is uh, what Ariadne gave Theseus to help him trace his path through the labyrinth to the Minotaur so that after defeating the Minotaur he could find his way back out again. The Minotaur and is half bull, half man. Half bull, half man. Yeah, that's not something you want to like meet in a dark maze where you can't find your way out. <laughs> um, but it just, once I understood that, I was like, oh my gosh, what a perfect analogy for this very process that so many of us go through, whether it's for quarter, quarterly reports or market level campaigns, or even just how can I myself make and maintain a transformational change. It's that, you know, we've got these monsters to slay. We've got these, these problems that we're trying to solve. Uh, and most of the time when we come up with a, an idea, so let's look at it from the perspective of we have an idea that we are sure is the right thing to do in a situation, you know, feel it's kind of to use the analogy of the, the maze, it's almost like we've suddenly found ourselves in the middle of the maze with exactly what we need to defeat the monster. We've defeated it, but then we're like, whoa. How do we get out? How did I get here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and how do I convince somebody else that what yeah. I just did was the right thing or that this idea yeah. is the right thing? And the answer really goes back to this idea of you know the this maze that our brain goes through because we come up with an idea, we decide that it's right because we have told ourselves a story about why it's right. So if we can surface that story and we we can articulate it for somebody else, and powerfully in 
the language that that person will understand, like from their point of view, then we've got a really powerful thing because we're now telling, yeah. we are, we are telling our idea through the lens of the story somebody else will tell themselves about it and ideally tell other people. Yeah. And I think in, in that, in that example, there's actually two things that need defeated. One is the maze before you can even yes. get to the Minotaur. And then there's the big beast at the end, which is the ultimate objective. But then how successful is it if you don't make it back? So figuring out he, he had that red thread spooled through the That's maze. Right. He was able to find it. So when we go into a, um, the creation of our red thread, we need to figure out not just how to get there, tell the story, but then also how to get back and pull people to where you started from to get those two conquests. Yeah, conquests. absolutely. Because what ends up happening is that you know the, the most common mistake I see people make in presentations and messaging, whether that's sales messages or market messaging, marketing messaging, whatever, um, pitches, <laughs> uh, yeah. is that we end up we end up explaining why our idea is right from our point of view, from somebody who has already mastered the maze and lived to, and the monster, by the way, and lived to tell yeah. the tale. And we totally forget that we did not always have that perspective. In fact, that we had to venture through those steps ourselves in order to reach that conclusion, whether we realized it or not, whether it was subconscious or not, we went through a series of steps saying, I want a thing, like I want to slay this monster. Okay, everybody's focused on this pa aspect of it, but not this one, right? So that's, I mean, I love the, the story is so applicable in so many ways because Theseus, you know, prior to him, everybody was like, well, let's kill the monster. And Theseus was like, wait a minute, what it's up? in a maze, which means that <laughs> maze is just as important as the monster. So therefore, let's bring a tool for each task, right? So, and, and whether that was explicitly the thought process or not, those elements had to be there. And so when we can... So, because what are, so what happens is that our brain our brain skips steps right because our brain just kind of subsumes the middle of the story it basically says want to defeat a monster in a maze bring a sword and a red thread and you're like huh like yeah. okay i get the sword like i that's gonna but why would i need a thread thread and you're like oh because i need to find my way out again and I see us do this with messages all the time where we're saying, hey, you want this thing? Well, then you should buy our thing. But there's this whole story in between about why that's the right answer. And it's not just features and benefits, by the way. It's, it's because there's a deeper problem that you actually solve and there's a deeper belief that's behind it. That's what we have to articulate to people because they've got the perspective from outside of the maze. They, they've not been in it yet. So we have to recreate the conditions in someone else's mind that created the idea in our mind in the first place. And if we can do that successfully, then your probability of success of any message, any presentation, any pitch goes up significantly because you're giving people exactly what they need to hear. You're not just saying what you want to say, you're finding what they need to hear in what you want to say. And that's an incredibly powerful moment when you can start to do that. Absolutely. And I, I love what you said there too about the mind. It, number one, it's wired for it. It's how we want to receive, but it also can be an enemy of developing your red thread because it wants to fill in, it wants to like cheat the process without yes. it being successful. It's not the cheat code. The red thread is the ultimate universal cheat code. Yes. How do we yes. like, how do we combat our, it, it's an impediment to be successful. How do we work against our minds or allow our minds to do the proper work to get through the red thread process? Yeah. Oh my gosh. There's so many, so many ways to go with this. Um, yeah. And I have, you know, it feels like, <laughs> it feels like a three headed monster that keeps coming back. Right. Because it's, yeah. it's always, the <laughs> it's always the challenge. Um, you know, my, uh, it, because what we what we do right is that we end up just giving when we kind of skip to the end so if you're you know if a fan of the princess bride that's essentially what our brains do is like skip to the end you know yeah. from <laughs> like oh you've got a problem like hey you know our thing solves it um but if we were just to tell a story where we're saying, you know, once upon a time, there was a, you know, a bratty kid named Luke who ended up saving the galaxy. 
like, <laughs> like you're like, okay. <laughs> like, but the same thing is true with our, with our messaging, right? So I kind of take it to an illogical extreme with one of my presentations. And it was like, so you want to improve your health? I've got the perfect thing for you, leeches. But if we, and, and it's kind of like, and in my mind, that may make perfect sense about why, given a certain complaint that you might have, where I'm like, my brain goes right to leeches. But like, yeah. you're like, well, well, why, why? And I could be like, well, they're natural, like they're inexpensive, they can be very successful. And like, again, I can give you all the features and benefits of a leech that you like would never want. And it still doesn't change your mind because you don't understand the thought process behind why I think the leech might be the right thing. And so, right. you know, depending on the situation, if I explain my thought process as being based in the medieval approach of the four humors, and I'm like, well, I think you've got a little bit too much blood humor going on, Ed. Um, right. So I think you need to like bleed it out a little bit. You'd be like, you are out of your mind. No. Right. But if I were to say, okay, Ed, maybe you were in a situation where you had to have some kind of reconstructive surgery and there's a skin graft and there's this thing that can happen where these tiny, tiny blood vessels um, you know, can get clogged up and then interfere. But hey, there actually is a solution that can keep that the blood flowing through even those tiniest blood vessels. And it happens to be the saliva of a leech then you're going to be a little, which by the way, leeches are used exactly for that now yeah. these days because they have that property. You might not be super excited about a leech, but you, now you're like, okay, at least I understand it. It's so the main thing it, to get to the objective. You're, yeah, you're bringing exactly. it right now. So if you've ever, have you ever had that experience where someone has gone, yeah, but the end justifies the means. And you're like, not in eh. this case. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, and, and, this is this, it's 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 right in that tension that I am like so fascinated, particularly right now, because for two people, let's say a company and their customer who agree that the the means to an end are the right ones, right? They're going to be totally aligned. Like I totally agree that this is the right way to approach, um, you know, adventure and outdoor gear. So I'm going with Patagonia, right? Um, but if there's a company where you're like okay, you may still have the same ends. You may actually provide me some kind of like outdoor gear, but oh my gosh, everything you're producing it from is just absolutely wrecking the environment that I'm trying to explore. Well, then those, that, those ends, as much as I may want them, don't justify the means to me. And right. so what this really is, what the, what the red thread is, another way to think about it, it's, it's exposing our means to the ends and making sure that we're, we're clear on that first as a, as a company or as an individual so that we can be better at articulating it to our audiences. Because ultimately, it's not just the product that people are looking for. They're looking for, does this product and everything that it represents actually align with how I see the world? And so that's why it's so important to really understand that and go back through that process to say, well, how do we see the world? Um, how, how, so, that, so that you can have that position of being able to articulate it for other people. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think one of the things you've, all, you've also mentioned is that the people, you said the people you serve, mm -hmm. that's how you position the, whether we're a business or the story you want to tell. It's if you take the position of I'm serving this audience, that means that you're providing value deep degrees of empathy, you take the time to give them something, allow that story to be in their, allow them to place themselves in that world and its value deliver. How yeah. important is that for us as folks who tell brand narratives, business people, and the marketing application, I'll call it, to look through a lens of serving? I, I think it's, well, if you're, if your desire is to be successful more of the time <laughs> um, and long term. So because I'm I'm very much somebody who's very much about, like I said, making a man maintaining transformational change, not just driving action, but driving permanent or at least long lasting shifts in thinking or behavior. Because yeah. for all the years that I spent in marketing, I don't know a single marketing person that has ever felt like they've had enough money, enough time, or enough people to do what they need to do. So I'm all, I was just absolutely dedicated to like, how can I do this once? Like, I just want to be able to do it once. And 
so if you are also in that mindset of we want to get people's attention, keep it, and then keep them aligned with us, then you absolutely have to know what it is that those people want, what it is that they're looking for, how your product fits into their worldview, not how you can shift the worldview to accommodate your product. That's really important. That distinction yeah. is super subtle, but it's very important is that our job is to figure out, particularly as communicators, is to figure out why our idea already would make sense to these people without them yeah. having to change what they want, without them having to change their beliefs um, and without us ever having to convince them, right? Which in my mind, convincing is moving somebody from kind of one position to a new one, um, kind of forcibly, right? Like a, a yeah. pull rather than they're kind of like doing it themselves. Um, you can't do that unless you really have that, that, Kind of, it's almost like a two-way thing because it's. I I don't believe you should you should kind of serve the audience at all costs because you know it's a lesson I learned in nonprofits. If you're if you chase any gift that a donor will give you, that's a really good way to get off your mission really really quick. For sure. Um, and the same thing is true for companies. If you're like, well, we're trying to serve all the audiences that ever could be, well, you end up getting really confused messaging out in the marketplace and for people saying, well, is this really for me? Because I thought this brand was for this kind of folks. And now I'm seeing that it's for these kinds of folks. Like you could see that uh, kind of in the early days when car manufacturers, particularly luxury car manufacturers started to produce cheaper models, right? I remember when the, the like the Mercedes E-Class, for instance, first right. came out and oh my gosh, there was an up. Not that I've ever owned a Mercedes or could, um, but that I just remember because I went to a very swanky private school, like, but I was not of that same financial status. Um, but I just remember people being like, oh my gosh, well, now that those people can have an E class, I'm not sure, <laughs> like, a Mercedes, I don't know that I want one anymore. And you still yeah. see ripples of this, like when Maserati came up with, the, like, it's cheap. $40,000 car, um, you know, or when, you know, Porsche came up with, it's like, it's sedan. Everyone's like, well, I don't, am I, am I still a Porsche person if Porsche is making a sedan? And I'm like, I, I don't know. That's up to you, buddy. Um, but it's like, I think you really have to understand truly who you're for. And it doesn't mean that, that you can't have segments of your audience, right? Like, but right. that's why it's important to, to me to get deeper than demographics, even deeper than psych psychographics and say, what is the mindset? What's, and more importantly, what's the worldview of these people? Like, what are yeah. they trying to do? What problem are they trying to solve? What, what tensions are they trying to resolve? What are the beliefs that those are based on? Because it's those things that are creating that, thread red thread that through line that it's really like an operating system in mm -hmm. you know for somebody it's it's the lines of code that are dictating why a person or a brand even uh, operates the way that it does you know and so to me that's why it's so important to 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 figure that out because you want to know both from the brand side but individual personal or not why you do what you do the way that you do it but you also want to know why your audience does what they do the way that they do it. Because if you don't understand that, you're never going to get them to understand why your product or service is a good match for what they want and how they want it Yeah, for their ends that, and their means. Absolutely. And I love what you're hitting on, which is there's this, this amazingly powerful, even more powerful than the rational side of the brain, which is the emotional side of the brain. Yeah. Uh, you're also hitting on something that is, it's, it's different from, it's almost, I'll call it a little bit, it is contrarian from the idea of um, forcing people into a new place, like the, the mental reef, uh, the, uh, um, the reframing of the problem, forcing them into a problem they didn't think they had. But what you're doing is you're forming who they are today into this potential you know, future state making it almost their I they see themselves in the situation and in doing so you remove yeah. some of the emotional barriers that they've got the emotional barriers up and the story moving we, weaving them through that maze pulls some of these emotional barriers down connecting with them 
uh, potentially make them, making them enough uh, to that level of being, you know, able to a- obtain your new idea. Yeah. How, how mean, does emotion play into that? Uh, so it's just, it's so much, I mean, so to, to paraphrase the, the, um, psychologist uh leon fessinger we are not rational decision makers we're rationalizing decision makers we make these these decisions you know even in b2b by the way and as these are these are and i don't know that emotion is quite the right way to put it but we make these decisions based on you know intuition and gut and but what's fascinating about intuition and gut is that it's it's based in these stories and if you deep dig dig even deeper those stories have a logical structure which is kind of cuckoo right if you think about it because you're like oh wait there actually really is a logic to to emotion like so if something and it really just comes down to you know this you know between this kind of this formula and for lack of a better term or the fact that between you know desire and action lies belief right and and while the belief part is oftentimes, um, you know, we associate that with emotion and not rational. It's like it's based on what we observe and what we, you know, what we deal with and all of that. But when there's an alignment, right? Like if you just super simplify emotions to like happy and sad, like positive and negative emotions, when there is a, a positive alignment between what somebody wants and what they believe and what they're doing, well, that's when people feel good because all three of those things, all three of those major parts of the story feel right. Like, what do I want? Why do I want that? Why is this the right thing for me to be doing? Right. And yeah. you know, why am I the right person? Or why is this the right thing for, for the reason to be doing it? And therefore, what am I doing? Um, when they're not in alignment, either you don't get the action or you don't get the good feeling about it because it's like, okay, I'm getting what I want, but I'm trading off this other thing that I value. I'm probably not going to do that long-term. Like we know that pain is the enemy of long-term change. We will not do something long-term yeah. that's emotionally, physically, or mentally painful for us. Um, so that to me is where, you know, we, we want to be focused as much as possible on, creating those positive emotions, which don't just mean making someone feel happy. It means yeah. avoiding the introduction of the negative things of the things that feel misaligned because the misalignment is where people get uncomfortable. It's where they get scared. It's where they get anxious. It's where they get angry, right? Because, you know, for all sorts of other reasons, but it's, it's when the, the, the belief doesn't lie, align with what they want and how to get it. That's where it all goes wrong. So to me, I mean, we've, you know, we've spent a lot of time, it feels like in the last couple of decades, focusing on like, you know, storytelling is emotion. But what I've discovered is that storytelling fundamentally is a logical thing. And it's an illogical, and it's the, cre- you know, whether the logic works is whether or not you get positive emotions. And if the logic doesn't work, you get negative emotions. Um, and, or, you know, and, and, and so we actually can take control of something that I think for a lot of us felt like we couldn't control, like, well, how can we control people's emotions? Well, or how can we account for that? Well, because if you can control for, if you can control for and, and, account for how people think, even if it's pre-conscious, right? Even if it's in that kind of gut intuition piece, because now we know that that, how we think emotionally is actually through story. Now you can actually figure that out. You can actually figure out like what would be the story that's logical to the brain that's going to arrive at both a, a, you know, both an emotionally and intellectually satisfying answer for somebody. Yeah. Yeah. And you, and you focus in on making inactivity impossible yes. through this. And I love that term because it's almost like you have to connect on all points because objective of storytelling is potentially to have somebody take an action, but yeah. if they're, if they're not going to move, if they are, um, remain, you know, in the same place, your, your objective of the story didn't really happen. You didn't move them 
you know, you didn't really, yes, you didn't change them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All stories, all you're right. All stories are about change or transformation in some way, you know, um, it doesn't mean they always are successful, um, right? Because some of you know the great tragedies oftentimes are because something didn't change, right? Like that that's actually what happened. You know, like tragedies are often because something was not changeable, um, or somebody, someone was not changeable. But by and large, when we're talking about business storytelling, as far as like business narratives and things like that, like those should yeah. always be positive, happy stories, right? They should always be stories that work because we're not going to be like, let's set up the story where here's the thing that you want. And yeah, we're not, we can't do that for you. I'm like, you're not, you're, <laughs> um, unless that's part of a qualifying conversation, like that's not like your market message. Um, so when it comes to you're making inactivity impossible. It's when kind of from on every level, emotional and intellectual, the thing that you're presenting is as a, as a, a different and ideally better way to get for someone to get what they want. It should just, it should check all of those boxes. And when something yeah. makes emotional sense, when it makes it, you know, so when it makes both intuitive and intellectual sense to, to somebody, um, it becomes something that they can't unhear. And it means that that action may not happen always right away, but this is something I would see happen oftentimes when I was back when I was a Weight Watchers leader. It was just like something would sit in there and it would just kind of cook. And eventually there would get to be a point where someone was like, all right, either I actually want this thing or I don't. Like either I either want to accomplish this goal or I don't, let's say for instance. Um, and it allows you know, that moment, right, where something will shift, like if we create, so in storytelling, it's called a, a moment of truth, or my favorite word for it, an anagnorisis, which is when oh, the character, I know, it's so good. when the character recognizes the true nature of their circumstances is how Aristotle, I think, or some translation of Aristotle uh, on that. And, and it's the reason why it's called a moment of truth is because, I think, I don't know exactly why it's called a moment of truth, because it's the moment where the main character has to decide. They have to decide between competing truths. Um, and oftentimes those, it's a three way, it's a three way race, right? It's a, it's a, a race between what they want, what they believe and their course of action so far. And the moment that you can, create that tension and, 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 and kind of surface that, that there is in fact a battle there for folks. That is one of those things that we know, you know, researchers, scientists, psychologists, cognitive behaviors know is a, is a gap that we can't leave open. So in the book, I talk about it as when true truths fight, only one wins. Um, and that's because like something's always going to give, like we, even though kind of passively we can have you know live with two competing things in our lives right we can you know anybody who is a smoker right at one and, and a parent you know if they were ever that simultaneously for a while there was something that allowed them to kind of like hold both of those things equally but whenever you can force that battle right and that's yeah. kind of what i'm really interested in is how can we how can we surface that battle so someone you know, again, whether we're talking about a different way to buy building materials or whether we're talking about achieving weight goals, when you can create that battle between truths, right? So do you still really want this? Do you actually believe this? And if both of those things are true, do you see how your current course of action doesn't work, right? Like that's where we're trying to get to a point and we're trying to sw swap in something else that says, if you want this and if you believe this, then this is the thing. And then that's the, that's the point where just because, again, emotionally, intellectually, intuitively, all of that works, that's that moment where people will almost always, they will, they, something will change. If it's constructed well, the message will change them towards that new product service idea. Um, or, and I think this is, can be just as valuable, it's going to tip them it's going to get them to decide that they actually, that actually isn't the thing that they want, right? Like actually, no, we're not looking for net zero carbon emissions. We're just looking for lower, right? right. Fine. Right. But that's, that's, to me, that's a success from a messaging standpoint too, because now you have a better clarity about who, 
is or isn't your customer. Um, right. Because your customer, your customer should be the people who want the thing that your product provides, right? Yeah. Or your idea provides. And if it, and if they don't want that, one of the hardest things we can ever do in this world is to make somebody want something that they don't want, or even harder to unwant something that they do. So just, you know, one of the most powerful ways to start to that, to that point of like making an activity impossible is to make sure that you're anchoring your message about your product or idea in something that you are really sure that that person wants and is very unlikely to stop wanting. Yeah. You also described it. First of all, you're putting out these amazing formulas. There's definite cheat codes in that. I, I love, wanna... I love cheat codes. I live by cheat codes. Yeah. Like I can make anything into a framework or process. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I, de I definitely want to talk about that, but you also, do you also find this in so doing um, a brand or a company also helps with their own identification of who they are because yes, you, 100%. so it's good for that self um, the understanding the why and articulating who we really are. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the analogy I like to use is that, you know, it's, I see the red thread as distinct and, and distinct from, but fully connected to a company or a person's brand in the same way that the how, source code of a website and the appearance of a, of the site itself are distinct but completely interconnected right so to me the brand like and my definition of brand is is the sum total of people's experiences of you right so what do they think of when they think of you Love um, that or your definition. brand or your, you know whatever um you know, that's how the website looks, right? Like it's, you know, it's blue and it's purple and it's got a button here and like, you know, this thing moves. Um, but the reason why it looks that way, the reason why it behaves that way, the reason why your experience with it is the way that it is, is because all of that is set in its code. And yeah. So, and any good developer will tell you if something's wrong with the website, usually what do you have to do? You have to go figure out what's wrong with the code, right? And to me, when we're talking about branding and messaging, it's, we need both things. So I think there has been almost this overemphasis on brand, on figuring out like, well, how can we make sure that people think of us the way that we want them to think of them? And what that ends up doing is sometimes it ends up creating a gap between what we wish people thought about us and what we are actually doing and how, right? Yeah that that is that again is out of alignment with that and so if we can understand our own red threads if we can understand the story you know i said it right at the beginning these red threads are a story that drives action it's the story that a, even a company is telling itself about why how it behaves is the right way right um because you look at, you know, kind of classic failures of companies or classic you know like enron or you look at companies that supported wildly toxic behavior, like, you know, the, you know, like Miramax and Harvey Weinstein, there was something in enough of those people collectively that said, we're going to be okay with conducting business this way. Right. That was a story they were telling themselves or even less dramatically. There is something in how United Airlines conducts its business to say that it is okay to drag somebody off a plane. Right. And yet at the same time, the brand they put out there is fly the friendly sky. So there's this like mismatch out there. My point is that if you can really understand that source code, that red thread, that, that kind of book of beliefs, that storybook of beliefs and the set of how they all flow together um, behind your business, you're going to understand what are the beliefs that drive the behavior that set the brand. And it's that kind of the that cascade that I think a lot of times we just stop at brand and we don't really look at the behavior and we certainly don't look at why we're behaving that way. But if we can really understand those beliefs, then, then we solve for so much. We can diagnose why there's a gap. We can diagnose um, where there's better opportunity. We have, we have a much better understanding of who we're for, who, who we can serve and who we would attract to us because of that. And we have an opportunity to really double down on those things that are 
already strong about us, our brand or whatever, because they are the muscles that we've built doing what we're doing. So yes, understanding your why, like Simon Sinecki and why is important because that's the why behind your what. It's the why behind you know what you do. But I think we've underserved the why behind our how. Why do we do what we do yeah. the way that we do it? And to me, that is a much more powerful place to start because it is what goes through everything, you know? So it, it, it really is, it's not, and it's not even just your core message. It's just your core, like I said, it's like a core book of beliefs. Um, right. And you're never going to have, I think the book of business that you want, unless that is kind of like the book of beliefs, like lines up with it in, in a way that makes sense to people. Yeah. That is amazing. I mean, it is impossible for anybody who listened to this right now not to be motivated to take action to find their red thread. I'm like Yay. literally fired up. <laughs> Go find literally it. It's just up. so important. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think because I, I just see it over and over and over and over again with my clients where it's just, you know, and I see it particularly when I'm working with them to develop like variants on the message. Because oftentimes we'll, they'll come in and we'll, we'll say, okay, let's, let's build the core yeah. message for this product or service for this audience. And then we start to do all, you know, we start to do variations to say for a different audience. So for instance, a client I've been working with in New Zealand, you know, they, um, they're an artif artificial intelligence software company. Um, you know, and one of the, the, the original message that we built, the original red thread that we built or that we found, I should say is, uh, was for banking. Right. And, without revealing everything else about it, I can say like the core tension, the core problem that they end up solving, right, is that for the banking industry is a tension between kind of simple static tools, right, and and sophisticated dynamic situations, right? And right. that's what they solve. They help resolve that tension. So that's one piece of the red thread that we found, but that can be a really useful thing, again, from a brand messaging standpoint to say, hey, here's the core tension we resolve. Now, we just finished working on how that message or how they would talk to, about themselves to CPG companies. Um, and in that case, the core tension they resolve is between tools and experiences. Um, in other words, you know, they, they're, you know, for companies that are trying to, you know, sell more without, but drive while, while driving their cost of sales down, like actually, you know, how do we kind of maintain our sales, but don't put so many reps in the field, for instance, okay, we give them tools, but we focus on the tools more than the experiences those tools provide. Now note that there's that, you know, in message number one, the tension is between, you know, kind of simple static systems in face of sophisticated dynamic challenges and in the second one it's simple static tools right that don't account for sophisticated dynamic experiences right so even though the words are different like the concepts are the same and this is where mm -hmm. it can be really powerful because now when you're trying to find let's say if they're trying to find yet a third organ thing now they to me, it's saying, listen, at the core of this company is this belief that if you get the right information delivered at the right time, you can actually resolve that tension. Um, yeah. And I just see that over and over again. And now see how powerful that is for that company to say, this is what we do. So it allows them not only to talk about what they already do in a more powerful way, but what I've seen with other companies that I've worked with, it starts to get them to go, Actually, since this is what we know how to do really well, why don't we start doing this new uh, new thing that we're doing? Because that's also this, you know, that's also resolving this tension, or that's also based on this kind of core core belief. So, um, I just love seeing that. And you know, in the beginning of my coming up with this process, it was really just a hypothesis that that would be what happened. And it's been so exciting over these like six years now and, and literally hundreds of clients just, just to see that happen over and over again, where at the end of it, and I say this in the book that, you know, kind of a, a free prize inside to quote Seth Godin, um, of doing this is that you end up finding not just the red thread of a particular message, but you end up really starting to get strong hints, if not the actual red thread of you, 
whether that's you as an individual or you as a company, you really start to understand what is what is the code by which you operate. Um, and understanding that code gives you so many opportunities like to, to change it, to accentuate it, to, to strengthen it, to celebrate it. Um, and I think fundamentally, a lot of times when we're just, you know, we're trying to find like what's the silver bullet for marketing or messaging, we've, we've missed the fact that what got us to this point, actually what got us here will get us there. We just mm -hmm. need to understand really what that is. I love that. Yeah. I liked also you've all verticalization of your red thread. You know, it might just not be, you've, it's not one thread that goes, but you're going to have to think about the potential variations of how that thread needs to exist that you need to build for, um, you know, serving many yes. uh, in that, in that situation. Yeah. Because I mean, I'd say this in the book, but an idea and a message are not the same, right? A message is how you talk about an idea. And so I think this is, that's another place where I think we've just kind of gotten it wrong, where we try to like find our single brand statement. Like, well, that's only going to be true for a particular audience in a particular situation. So, you know, at one level, it can sound more complicated to have these variations, but at the same time, it's like, to me, it really comes down to, it's just, you choose what's the, what's the meta variation. So clearly for this particular company, this tension between, you know, simple, static, sophisticated, dynamic, like that's going to be true. That's true across. And that's, that tends to be the, the pairing that they use the most often. But once you know what it is, you can kind of dress it up in different clothing. So you know, a quote that I use in the book from Agatha Christie is that words are only the outer clothing of ideas. And I love that because it means yeah, that okay. we just, yeah, once we understand truly what the idea is or truly what it is that we do and how it is and why we do it that particular way, well, now we have enough information to actually understand the shape of it so that we can message it differently for different people, but not in a way that's confusing. So that anyone that were to look across would to say it's the same concepts we're just, you know, we're just positioning it differently for these folks. We are not changing for our different audiences. How we talk about what we do is changing based on, based on who we're talking to and what it is that they want to achieve and what we want to achieve with them. That's beautiful. I, you know, for folks who like to have mantras in their heads to ask every day, for me, you know, I'll even, you know, call to action to everybody, ask the question, what's the red thread in this? What's your red thread? Um, it's just a, it's a, it's an extremely powerful question to, to getting to, getting to the why uh, and the what. And uh, yeah, Tamson, thank you so much. The, the cheat code yeah. you dropped are invaluable. I want folks to get these. Um, where can, we're obviously going to put some links uh, into the, the show notes here, but are there any key um, digital properties you own? You want to let folks know they can go consume more of your works? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the, 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 the highest cheat code per, you know, minute uh, is probably going to be in my book <laughs> um, <laughs> because that, that's filled with them. Um, so, but you can find you can that at, at redthreadbook.com or yeah. you know, sign up for my newsletter at tamsinwebster.com slash newsletter. Um, I'm, I slow down a little bit in the summer. So expect that if you sign up, you're not going to necessarily see something right away. I'll pick back up, I think probably September, October. Um, but that's where I noodle new cheat codes and things that I'm working on uh, first. And so, you know, as I'm starting to think about my next book, um, I'm definitely starting to, to test out concepts, um, you know, and, and, and see what works there. So yes, I'd say book first. And then for newsletter would be the, the, the kind of say, okay, well, that's where, you know, that's got, you know, the book is yeah. you know, from beginning to now. And the newsletter is like, what's next. That's cool. I'm going to buy a bunch and uh, give some out to some of our subscribers oh, thank um, you. in order to keep that conversation going. And the audio book came out in May. So if you, you know, you just want to have me like, you know, put my dulcet tones in your ear, like talking you through it. That's also possible too. It's your voice. It is. Yes. I had to audition for it, but I passed. So it is, <laughs> it is me reading my own book. So yes. Perfect. Like those are my favorite. Whenever it's the author's voice, you can literally hear uh, the voice of the, the word creator. Amazing. Tamson, thank you so much. Really appreciate so it. You, 
you've given this world a gift. Now it's up to us to go do something with it. Oh, thanks. Well, I think everybody has a big idea. Uh, and it's it's just a matter of making sure that the, the rest of the world understands how and why it's as big as it is. So uh, good luck to everyone in finding those red threads. And uh, I, I'm so excited to be back here again. So thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks for being on the pod. 